John Sewell here with the Engearment.com podcast. Super excited, as always, to have my good friend Pat Flynn on for at least a half dozen or seventh time. And Pat Flynn, if you don't know who he is, he has authored several books, Amazon bestsellers, and we're going to talk about his most recent work and the newest book as well. Pat, welcome back to the show. Sean, it's a super awesome and honorable pleasure to be here. Always a joy to be back on the Engearment podcast. Well, thank you, sir. You're one of our favorite guests. I um, I think I mentioned like the first or second episode after that. I was in the backcountry, and some of my friends who are like avid backcountry skiers had picked up on, on you, and um, your path to uh, refining religion and mm-hmm. fitness and and philosophy. And so uh, it's it's fun to share you with with our outdoor audience and stuff. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, no, thank you. It's always you're a wonderful host. I always enjoy and benefit greatly from our conversation. So happy to be here. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, um, let's touch on, we have so much to talk about, and it's going to be easy, it's always easy to talk with you. Um, your most recent book, what are you working on? Yeah, so I'm working on, let me back up a little bit just to give people a little bit of perspective. So a lot of people obviously know me for the stuff I do in fitness, but my more formal backgrounds are economics and philosophy. That's what are my actual kind of like academic backgrounds. So for um, some time, I've been working on a, a larger book on uh, metaphysics and natural theology. So these are branches of philosophy that try to probe at the ultimate foundation. Of things, uh, they they ask big questions about causality and identity and change and 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 the ultimate foundations. You know what is that? Uh, you know what is what is the ultimate theory of everything? That's kind of what metaphysicians are concerned with. You know, it's going over and above the physics. And uh, for me, a lot of this becomes really interesting because it just ties into sort of the naturally biggest questions of life: questions about God's existence, God's nature, the meaning of life. So as somebody who was, uh, had a young interest in philosophy, I was always kind of drawn uh, increasingly to metaphysics uh, because it seemed like if, if, there, if you were able to answer the biggest questions, it seems like this is where you would have to go uh, to, to be able to seriously engage with them. Um, science, as wonderful as it is, is just, it's just restricted. It, it can tell us a lot of things, a lot of very important things, but it can't, it can't really reach the same heights or depths, depending on how you're looking at it as, as metaphysics. Um, so that's kind of why I was always, I was drawn to that. Um, so for me, my background was, I was, a, you know, you kind of hinted at this already. I was kind of a skeptical person for a very long time, not religious. Uh, my introduction to philosophy was with many of the old atheist thinkers like Nietzsche and uh, Camus and, and some of these guys. Uh, but as I got deeper and deeper, into the philosophical traditions and conversations, um, that, that whole worldview just, just kind of fell apart for me. And we can explore the details if, if that's of interest, but I'll just give the brief synopsis here. And I kind of stumbled upon some of the more traditional thinkers. Well, I was familiar with them before, but I decided I want to really reinvestigate these guys. I want to really reconsider, you know, kind of alternative worldviews that I haven't paid so much attention to, you know, going back to Plato and Aristotle and Boethius and Augustine and Aquinas and then all the contemporary thinkers. Um, and when I discovered uh, the sort of tradition of natural theology of just like armchair thinking about God, apart from, apart from, you know, any claims of revelation, but just like, can we use reason to argue for not just God's existence, but God's nature that really captivated me. And then to see the intellectual rigor behind this tradition was something that was really fascinating as well. So that's kind of where I, I really focus my attention and research, uh, especially in my master's program in philosophy. So what I've wanted to do um, for about the, since I finished my last book, the one, uh, the little green one, How to Be Better at Almost Everything, is take a lot of the work I did in my master's program and try and uh, bring it to the people. Uh, try and make it, uh, you know, I try, and trying to find this balance between accessibility but also rigor. And, uh, and because I feel like there's something valuable there. Um, so what I've, what I've done is I've taken just a small snippet of this larger book project I'm working on. And I just, I put it on Amazon for just a dollar ebook just to get something out there. If, if nothing else, just to continue to motivate myself to finish this stupid project. Um, and, and yeah, so yeah, that's, that's where I'm at with it. It's about done. Um, of course, the rewriting and the revisions and the editing always takes for me a lot longer than the initial write. Um, but yeah, if anyone wants a sample, I've got this little ebook on Amazon called how to think about God, uh, which I just, which I just, I sent your way last night. I wasn't sure if you had a chance to peek through that at all yet. Oh yeah. I'm going to take it up camping tonight and read it. 
Sweet. I do that. Oh, that's great. And I like you. This is a very deep topic, and I'm going to get more into it. But you touched on something that us writers can appreciate, too, about it, it's hard to edit. So, like, what, what do you say? Write quick, edit slow? That's, that's always been a process that works well for me is you just, if you have an idea and you have inspiration, you have to get out of your own way and you just have to get it on paper as quickly as possible. It, you, you almost have to vomit it on paper, to be honest. It's, 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 kind, it's kind of a gross process. And yeah. then when you go back and you look at it, um, I mean, you, you're always thoroughly disgusted with yourself. <laughs> No human could ever write that bad. Time to time to hang it up. Uh, but it's it's at least you know it's heartening when I read other writers that I really look up to and they share their first drafts. their really crappy first drafts, and you realize, oh, this okay, this is just the process that everybody else goes through, and that good writing is editing. Uh, I'm convinced of that. Good writing is is editing. Uh, so yeah, it, that's that's how it always is for me. My first draft is always it's not it's not even like close to mediocre. My first draft is always awful it's always awful <laughs> that's very uh, uh very humble of you and hopefully any writers of any background and genre for for example i have i think 32 writers now for engagement and they're always they get writer's block everybody gets it and i'm like just just get it out and come back to it and we'll edit it together if you want like just get it out you have thought just just get them out yeah and it's once you start once you get out of your own way um you know, that's when you can really start to find your groove and, and find your tone and find your style as well. And then there's, you know, I have a couple uh, tricks as well. It's like once you're, once you're in that groove, when you go back to edit, you know, lop off like the first two to three paragraphs and you'll probably find a good lead just right there, right? Because the first two to, two, you know, two to three paragraphs, you're probably trying too hard. You're still getting in your own way. You're trying, you're trying to grab attention. You're trying to be funny. And as long as you're like trying to do all those things, you're probably not doing them very well. Mm -hmm. And it's not until you really get into that, that rhythm, that groove, um, that your, your authentic style and tone comes out. Um, so, yeah, just a, just a few. That's just how I approach it. Mm -hmm. no, that, and, and for reference, Pat is a proficient writer. Um, he's obviously a great orator, great speaking, but he, he's got a lot of written content. So this is good advice. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this is fantastic. I didn't mean to steer away from the bigger topic of how to think about God. Um, but there, I'll put a link in the show notes. It's $1 uh, on Amazon. All of 44 pages, too. So I'm pretty sure I can get through that tonight. Yeah, you know, I, I'll be curious your feedback to see uh, how... Um, because my what I wanted to do was was make it so it was accessible enough that even if people don't have any background in philosophy or metaphysics, that I do enough hand-holding that I can, I can at least get you through get you through it <laughs> how much you'll you'll get out of it is another question but at least get you through it but at the same time i uh want to engage with uh if even if you're a professional philosopher um i, I towards the end of the book i consider what i think are the strongest and most serious objections that you find in the in the literature and stuff like that too so that was really hard for me and it's it's always a difficulty of any writing project is deciding on your audience and for me i could you know you could go either either direction with that, and maybe this was a mistake on my part. We'll we'll, we'll see. <laughs> but I wanted to see. No, I want this to be accessible yet still rigorous. So that way, you know, no matter where somebody's coming from, this is the first time exploring the subject, or maybe I've been in the field for a while. Hopefully, they'll still get something out of it. That's great. You know, every time I talk with you, I'm listening and I'm taking notes and I'm learning because I don't have the background or even close to the background you do in these topics. The closest I have, and this is kind of funny, I inherited two ferrets, Camus and Nietzsche. That's as close as I have. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah. No, but really, I, I appreciate the philosophies, and I appreciate you uh, breaking it down to a more palatable uh, version for people like me. So really yeah, happy. yeah. And, you know, my um, – First off, I still love Nietzsche. I think everybody should 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 visit him and read him, especially like his genealogy of morals. I, I'm, I'm writing another article right now of of how relevant that is to contemporary just just politics and society. I think there's a lot of while I would disagree with his broad strokes of reality, I think he has very useful specific applications, and he's able to pinpoint some some very deep and true psychological aspects within within humanity. Um, but yeah, that's that's an aside. But he's still he's still somebody that's very much worth engaging with. Oh, that's good. Very good stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll give this a whirl tonight, and uh, listeners and viewers out there, it's available right now. So um, it's out there. Yeah, we we even hit uh, 
number one, uh, like new release in philosophy of metaphysics. And I was like, well, that's pretty cool. And I'm sure somebody will think, well, that's probably because there's only four books in that category. And, <laughs> and to that, I would say you, you might have a point, but we'll take what we can get around here, right? <laughs> Anytime. I love it. Yeah, I'm the number, number one book in the world on splitboarding and the only one. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like it's like, like people who set these world records in the lifts that nobody does. Yes, hey, hey good for you. that's creativity as far as I'm concerned. Good for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's good to appreciate that. Yeah, well, but much more to your credit, you've had number of books. Number one on Amazon. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many books do you even have right now out there? So I have, in terms of traditional published books, like through like Wiley or, or whatever, uh, four, and then if you include my self-published, like the shorter titles. And let's be honest, the self-published stuff aren't really books. They're like <laughs> thick pamphlets at best. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, like like seven, seven or eight. Uh, yeah. Um, and a lot of those self-published ones, you know, there's pros and cons to each. The traditional publishing is you get the full, you know, suite of editors and the, the power of a big publishing company behind you, which can also be um, really painful and, and cause a lot of headaches. I bet. And yeah, and you know, you, you lose creative control. So there's the pros and cons. With the self publishing, it's nice because you can get stuff out quick. You maintain full creative control. But I, I mean, look, it's I editors are really important. Uh, they are, and we all hate editors, right? Because they tear our work apart. Um, but I, uh, I've been writing for a while now, and I, I still don't trust myself to 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 publish something without having at least at least one other person. That's fair. Look through my work, but as much as I can, like I, I had, um, for this little ebook, I had, I had two people just edit it for just, you know, your, your typical, um, you know, grammatical content. Uh, but then I had, you know, three other philosophers just read through it in terms of its, oh, wow. its actual substance as well. That's, um, little, that's impressive. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah. So if people are interested in the big questions, check, check it out. I, I try to give a contemporary, uh, metaphysical argument, um, for what's called classical theism, which is a very robust, uh, form of monotheism. So it's not, it's not a book about religion. Um, but it certainly gives credence to one very important aspect of, of religion, or at least certain religions. So it's compatible with religion. It doesn't settle the big religious questions. Um, but it does, I think, um, it definitely pushes the conversation in a certain direction, the worldview conversation in a certain direction. Um, and then, and then invites, I would say it, it enables or invites a deeper um, seeking, spiritual seeking at that point. That's, that's really what I'm trying to do and show that there's very rational and reasonable grounds uh, for, for that further seeking. Mm -hmm. That's good stuff. That's really good stuff. And I like, I think two or three conversations ago, we talked about, my own personal, um, I don't say religion, spirituality, whatever you want to call it, is going into the outdoors, into the mountains, and just soaking it up right there. And um, so, yeah, I'm looking forward to doing that and reading your uh, your book tonight. Cool, and I look forward to your feedback, good sir. <laughs> Excellent. Um, okay, so this is one of the great things about Pat is the ability to talk in great detail about this as well as other areas, uh, music and fitness. Um, fitness is on my mind right now because tomorrow morning I'm launching a national uh, virtual training session for the law firm Brownstein Hyatt Farber Shrek. The, I've, I've been at that firm for 18 years in some capacity. I started in the mail room, then I went to accounting and IT, and then I left there to start my training business 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm really excited to offer virtual training. I don't, this is the first time I've done it when it's not like directly, you know, Yep, yep. Uh, with one or two or three or four people, it's they invited 600 people. So I was trying to wrap my head around how to develop a program. And uh, it dawned on me that you and Dan John had talked about this a few times, this 30, 30 for 30. Basically, um, 30 seconds of uh, exercise, usually body weight or something around the house, yeah. 30 seconds of rest, and it's for 30 minutes. Um, it's genius. I have like, <laughs> I've watched all of his videos. I'm going to put it to that to use starting this, this week. Um, what have you found helpful for training in a larger sense or, you know, uh, virtually for people? Yeah. Or even, yeah. in just groups too, because when you're training groups, um, the dynamics are totally different than when okay. you're training an individual. So this is something that coaches should definitely always keep in mind. And I've been one, you know, been blessed with wonderful experiences of training extremely diverse groups. I mean, to give you an example, when I was in, in college and I was just, um, and that's really how I got into the whole fitness scene um, was um, 
I, when I was going uh, to college originally, like I said, I wasn't going for exercise science or anything like that, but I was training people as a way to kind of pay my tuition and rent and stuff like that. So I was, I would teach, oh boy, it was a lot of classes. I would teach multiple classes a day, sometimes two to three, and I was personal training on top of it. So it was, it was exhausting. Yes. A lot of, um, a lot of Red Bull. <laughs> and, uh, but I would, I would bounce back. So I would teach at the university, right? I would teach kettlebell classes there at the university. And I would have, sometimes I kid you not, up to 80 freaking people in, in these classes. Wow. And, and just, we only had like 30 kettlebells. So like talk about like, uh, it was like, it was like the show chopped, but with kettlebells where they just give you this scenario. It's like, just deal with it, do something, be yeah. creative. And then I would also teach at the YMCA and they would have me teach like classes for, for senior citizens. Right. So it's like, now how do I deal? How do I deal with this? So it forced me to be very creative and I think, um, um, develop a, a number of different strategies for how to effectively train, train groups to make sure that, uh, they're getting effective workouts, but I'm also, you know, tailoring things enough to to the audience. And one thing I quickly learned, and this is to your point, is that getting or moving somewhat away from sets and reps and moving more toward timed work periods is yeah. is definitely something that's worth considering when training with groups because there's enough flexibility in there um, that you can have an, an awesome group dynamic, uh, and that's kind of what you want, where people are still kind of like all working together. Um, because the work periods are coordinated, um, and yet you can adjust things to the individual as need be um, based on intensity or how many reps you do in that time period, et cetera. Um, so, you know, if you're doing 30 for 30, and we can and dive into some more specific plans here, and you have a series of exercises, say you've got like goblet squats in there and swings and TRX rows or something like that, um, you can even, you know, the first round through, you can even just do just a few warm up sets. You know, maybe you do one or two reps on the goblet squat. You do some some hip prying and stuff like that. Um, or maybe, you know, or maybe one person's doing that and another person they're ready to go, so they're cranking out like fifteen reps or something like that. And but it's cool because they're all still together, yes. and this, this group dynamic is important because you, if you were to prescribe, you know, hey, five sets of five, somebody might finish that in half the time as somebody else, and then you get this this disjointed, dis disruptive class dynamic, which you, which you really don't want, or at least you want to try to limit that as much as possible as a group instructor, because then people um, can become confused or they can feel unnecessarily intimidated or, or other things that, you know, and there's, there's always trade-offs when it comes to coaching. But for me, at least, I always want to try and, and limit those, those, you know, nuisances as far as possible like you know sometimes we might admit of it to some degree because it might just be the only way to achieve something right mm -hmm. uh but time sets are a good way to um hedge against those disruptions and that disorganization and yet still allow people to find an appropriate but successful challenge for themselves and that's where something like a 30 for 30 is fantastic right because everyone's working together you get an awesome 30 minute workout in Great for a group dynamic, great for like circuits too. So if you have limited equipment, yep. you can spin people around. Um, so maybe you have like a body weight exercise, you have a kettlebell exercise, if you've got a barbell, you can throw that, th throw that in there, if you have a TRX. So it's a great strategy. Uh, so for me, it's, it's indispensable when it comes to training, you know, uh, anything more than, you know, well, it's great even by yourself. Who am I kidding, right? Even as an, it's great. It, like it's, I, I, you know, I love those workouts even just individually, but certainly for a group. I dig that. Thank you for uh, validating that. In, in small group training, I always had my little iPad and I would do 30 or 40 seconds on and X amount of time off. And that was, because I can't count for more than two people. <laughs> I suck at this for even for one person. But uh, yeah, and also structure. Like to have that time, like we know this is going to take eight or 10 minutes for this set. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you can, you can have, like I said, good control or as much control as possible over the situation so you don't have a bunch of loose ends and people are getting confused. It's very, very helpful. Yeah, it is. And it's, and it's also fun too. And I feel like that's the, one of the elements of training that's sometimes overlooked. It's, it's one of these, it's kind of the X factor. We want people to, we want people to really enjoy themselves as well, that we want them to reach their goals. Mm -hmm. um, but I think as coaches, it's important to remember that we're, we are not, always necessarily our customer yes. and and the balancing act we have to achieve is one where we we give them what we know they need as coaches but we also meet them somewhere along the lines with what they want yes. and if and that is a that is a difficult balancing act but i feel like yeah strategies like the 30 for 30 are are 
are worthwhile because definitely people, you know, kind of on the more basic consumer level, what do they want? They, they want a good workout. They want to feel like they worked out and all the better if there's an awesome group dynamic, there's good camaraderie, maybe even some good music, who knows, right? So give it to them. And, and then, you know, make sure that you're just programming that, you know, according to whatever you as a coach, uh, whatever you understand that they actually need as well. And that to me is, is a hallmark of, of somebody who gets it as a coach when you can find, when you can find that balance. Oh, that's good stuff. So all you fitness professionals out there, if you're having a little bit of a frustration trying to figure out how to group coach virtually time, even in person, it's fun. And also to, to Pat's point for my own personal training of myself, I use time as well. And it mm-hmm. might sound absurd, but like it's a huge amount of rest. I do basically a six to one work to rest, like 15 seconds of all out, ballistic and then up to two minutes of rest and yeah. that can get kind of boring for people you're training so i don't offer that to people unless they want that but, but you can mix it up too and that's what's cool is you know even with the 30 for 30 you can have prescriptions in there where you're just doing low rep heavy strength work in yeah that. and you know you might only do a few reps per set but so what that's fine oh mm-hmm. totally and if it's in person too i, I like with time because people can uh, swap stories and talk they're not worried about counting for themselves and that just brings the bonding in even more yeah. Yeah. The community is huge. And that's a big reason why people go like, I mean, that's what's, you know, kind of suck another sucky thing about this, this COVID situation is people are really losing uh, community mm-hmm. uh, in person community. And that's, that's weighing on people in a, in a big way. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, again, as coaches, we can't forget that one of the reasons people come to train with us is, is it's not just because of us. It's because of the connections they form with other people. Absolutely. Yes. And if you, hopefully you coaches out there um, have good personal relationships with the people that you work with, work for, and you care about them deeply. Because personally, I get as much out of it as they do oftentimes when I get to see them and see them smile. Well, not can't see them smile, but I can guess with the eyes right now because of the mask. <laughs> right with the mask on. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, uh, yeah it's, it's very important for connection. Like uh, here in Denver, we, you know, we still have masks uh, rule in place and we can't use a mask in the gym or we have to use a mask in the gym. So there's some, you know, things have changed and a little more rest break and lots of fans and this and that. But this weekend was my first big social interaction and it felt great. My uh, in-laws moved uh, to a new home 10 minutes from their old home. They have four daughters. My father-in-law came into town and it was all of us just working together to help them build their new home up and put things in mm. place. And that was, oh, connections. So important. So important right now. It, uh, yeah, it definitely is. You know, and even just if it's over Zoom or whatever, because again, unfortunately, another one of the sucky things about the situation is like suicide rate rates are just like surging right now. Yeah. It's like, yeah. And part of that is, is, you know, because we are part of our nature is not just rational animals, but we're rational, dependent, social animals to flourish. We need social interaction. We really yes. do. And if that's true, then we would expect that if you start to severely limit social interaction, you might see some some really negative consequences, and that's exactly what we're seeing. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh. And I don't I don't have many good answers to that. It's just a, it's a bad situation. So you know, if you can't do it in person because of you know whatever the regulations are in your state, it's um, you know one thing I do is I just have weekly meetings with with my friends on Zoom. You know, oh, I love it. <laughs> that helps, right? It, mm-hmm. it helps huge. I look mm-hmm. forward to it very much. I, no objective or no uh, no agenda, just seeing their faces, catching up. Um, yeah. It's so important. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a, a lot of it is free, like FaceTime or Google Duo, if you don't have an right. iPhone, and Zoom. I mean, it's very approachable. Anybody can learn how to do this in a couple of minutes. No doubt, yeah. I just wish I would have invested in Zoom before all this happened. I know, right? Mm-hmm. We would be sitting pretty bad. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's good stuff. Um, so what else are you cooking up over there? Are you working on any music? Yeah, I am. I've been jamming on a few riffs. I'm looking at my guitar right now. I was playing for a, a good while yesterday. Um, so for me, yeah, like I said, the first draft always sucks. <laughs> it's true. It's true for music. It's true for anything. So... Uh, I've got probably, I don't know, five or six just really rough, you know, I don't know, I don't like haphazard collections of, of riffs on the computer that I've just been looking at for a couple months, realizing I need to do something with it. But it's also the thing where it's like, again, it's it's easy and it's fun to like get down the initial rough sketch, but it's the painful process to refine it. Again, mm-hmm. good music is also editing as far as I'm concerned. And it's just one of those things where I just have to, yeah, I have to just 
because it's always it's a project like anything else. Um, so that's why for me it always goes in cycles. It seems like about once a year I might put out like three or four new tracks because it's 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 exhausting to yeah. really just to to refine it, um, the the structure of the songs to to make sure I I play all the parts well because I'm one of those guys where I don't like to. I don't like to layer or, or multi-track. For me, it's 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 one take all the way through. Oh, I like that. Not like yeah. or smashing pumpkins for overdubbing. Yeah, I don't loop. I hate looping mm-hmm. um, because I'm a huge ACDC fan, right? And there was something there's something I love about ACDC when you can notice that it's just a little bit different throughout the song every time. The dynamics because they're not they're not looping it. And some people say, well, that's an imperfection. No, I say that's a that's a mark of humanity that adds a, a dynamism and a liveliness to the music that I like, that I love. Van Halen's the same way, right? It's like, yeah, he never really kind of plays the riff exactly the same, exactly the same way when you're listening to it. And I love, I love the dynamics of that. Now you still have to play it extremely well because if you're sloppy, people are going to notice, but, um, so it takes, for me, it takes a lot of rehearsal because I'm not a naturally good musician. So it takes a lot of rehearsal, takes a lot of hours, takes a lot of practice. So, you know, for me to even just get out a couple of songs is a, it's a considerable project. But I do hope uh, my goal is to have at least three or four, you know, new, new ones out on the old SoundCloud that nobody listens to. Probably, <laughs> probably by, by December. And maybe just saying it on here will, will, you know, put my feet to the fire. And to add to, I'll, I'll put a link to your SoundCloud in the show notes. So awesome, man! Thanks. <laughs> I'll take what I can get. <laughs> I force people to listen to it on my kettlebell videos because so if anybody's been to my YouTube channel, most of the music in the background is is my music. And that's impressive because I was like, "That's some good rock, right? That's some good metal." And then mm-hmm. it was you. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we're doing it up mm-hmm. with my with just the the Gibson SG here. Yeah, I'm a fan of the SG. Yeah, it's a gr- it's a great instrument. You know, you get great tones. We've talked about this before. Oh. It's versatile, so that's been my primary now for like five years, and I'm happy with it. That's awesome. That mm-hmm. awesome. I, I forget if you mentioned my my first guitar was a BC Rich Ironbird, EMG pickups. Yep. Oh god, yeah, that thing is it's a beast. Yeah, the old BC Rich. I've only played a few of those. My what was my first one. It was an Epiphone. It was an Epiphone Les Paul. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, Sunburst. It was a good. It was a good starter guitar. Um, sure. mm-hmm. Was it yep. maybe like a traditional Les Paul? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. I got it. It was just so long ago. Um, my parents started me in the second grade, so I started pretty young, which wow. is always nice. If you can, if you want to get good at something, find a time machine. Start start when you're young. That's my best advice. I try to take that very seriously with my kids now. Like I'm just starting all my kids, like doing what I wish my parents would have done for me. Uh, as young as possible. Now, hopefully, I'm not like obsessive about it, but it's just it, it's so valuable to start younger. Now, at the same time, you can definitely learn new skills when you're older. Mm-hmm. Um, you can definitely do that, but there's just something about the kid brain that's so malleable. Like I've oh, just seen yeah. the progress my son has made at the piano in the in the past year. It's like, dang it, dang it, Dad, why didn't you do that for me? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> of course. Are you doing lessons with him still? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's funny because he's just like he's just he's just better than me. He gets it quicker than I do. Like I'm better than him because I've been a musician longer. But like his rate of progress is definitely, relatively speaking, much much higher than mine. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, as a dad, it's probably really cool to see him just soaking it up and. Yeah, it's it's you know it is it is it is awesome, and I never um, played piano until until last year when I started taking lessons with him. But it's one of those things that you wish you wish you would have started on sooner. You know? Absolutely. Yep. Mm-hmm. How yeah. about do you play do you play piano? No, not at all. Well, that's not true. Um, as a joke, somebody gave us this little electronic piano and like this little drum set. So I take it camping and I just do 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 do. That's piano. It's piano. It is a piano. You got chopsticks down? You're a pianist. Yep. <laughs> mm-hmm. I love it. Um, no, I, I, I've never taken lessons to learn anything for music-wise. Well, that's not mm-hmm. true. I, I played sax in, in uh, grade school. Mm. Yeah. But, um, and I bet, you know, I don't know, you know, how long you did that for, but, I, you know, like that early exposure, even if it's not super deep, it, it does something. It definitely yeah. does. Mm-hmm. It's like learning a new language or something. Like, oh, you can create things with your fingers and your mouth and, and other things and create sounds and change yeah. those sounds to suit your needs. It's, right. It's, and it, it sticks. Like, even if you lose it for a while, if, you've, if you had it when you're younger, it's always easier 
to come back to. Uh, I mean, for example, so I was I, I started learning music theory pretty young, and uh, studied it pre- pretty. I t- had two years of AP music theory in um, in high school, but then I but then I just left it pretty much at the time of college. And now I'm going back to it, and it's it's definitely rusty. Um, but like anything else, it's it's so much easier to reinvigorate something than it is to gain it in the first place. And like that's so true for physical strength too. Like it's it's yeah. so much easier to get like a strong deadlift again than it is to just get a strong deadlift for the first time. Right. That's a very good point. That's a very good point. Yeah. Speaking of uh, deadlifts, um, I haven't touched a barbell for a long time, maybe ten or twenty years, until I did the strong first uh, lifter certification with Doc Cardle. And you're right. You're like, oh that's how it feels and then you learn better nuanced movement patterns and you get better um what are you currently doing for your training for your i'm sport? back on the barbell baby nice we're back pa- yes. yeah we're back yeah no i got too freaking skinny during this covid stuff i'm like i need to <laughs> i need to put some meat back on my bones yeah. because i've just been i've been just doing some you know kettlebell complex training and uh some resistance bands so it, i've i've felt great. I've been recovering well because the intensity has not been as, as high as normal. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I've also just been eating less. So I've definitely lost some weight. And I like being lean. I like being on, I guess, the the, the leaner side. Um, but I'm like, yeah, I just need to, I need to go back. I need to just crank the volume and intensity back up, at least for a little bit here. Sure. And, and start, you know, start going back to Chipotle for my post-workout. <laughs> you <laughs> know what I mean? Yeah, we have yeah. to here too. Uh, yeah. Right. To get the, just to get those calories. in. yes, yeah, so what am I doing? I'm doing about a three kind of uh, pretty higher volume full body workouts now, um, leaning more towards hypertrophy again, um, because I, like I said, I'm determined to try and gain some of this weight back. Um, so two days are predominantly upper body focused hmm. with some lower body work and then one day predominantly lower body focused with some upper body work. And then the rest of the days are just mobility walking, maybe a little conditioning. I like it. I like it a lot. Uh, sumo or traditional on deadlift? I'm a conventional. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I've just, I've always pulled conventional. So I, in my program right now, I have conventional deadlifts one day and I have rack pulls another day. Oh, okay. Uh, cool. Yeah. And then, um, so yeah, it's, it's hybrid. So I'm still doing kettlebell stuff, but I'm doing, yeah, I'm doing the, the hinging, the, the heavy hinging with barbell. Um, I'm doing, uh, yeah, pretty much all the lower body at this point, except for swings. I have swings in there, um, on those, on those hinging days, um, front squats, barbell. So yeah, I'm, I'm back on the barbell right now. Uh, military press with kettlebell. I still like the kettlebell for military yeah. press. Um, uh, and then yeah, for the conditioning, almost exclusively kettlebell and running. I dig it. And on the front squat this way or? Yeah, I've got I've got decent mobility, so I can get cool. the shoulders up. Yeah, so I've I can, I can do that. If if you can't do that, um, so sometimes people will go to the kettlebell front squat, but the kettlebell front squat is quite different than the barbell front squat because it's actually more like a zercher squat than it is a, a a barbell front squat. It's just a very different exercise, a fantastic exercise. Mm-hmm. I'm a huge fan. It's an awesome exercise, but it's just is it just is quite different than a barbell front squat. Yeah. You know, I was looking at this from the side, and um, I think Doc turned me on to this, like the clock, like your back's a clock. And in a goblet squat, you're basically at six, right? Then mm-hmm. it changes to go to a back squat, then, of course, to hinge, you know. Yep. So it's interesting to think about how, how the weight is loaded, where it's loaded, uh, distal, medial, and, and how you operate around it. Yeah, so it depends. It depends what you're looking for. It depends on the goal. Um, for me, barbell front squats feel good. I'm not. I'm not a huge fan of the back squat. I'll do, I'll I'll begrudgingly do it on the program <laughs> every now and then. I've never been great at it. It's always a sissy lift for me. We all have those lifts, right? Like if, if yeah, where it's like if you're going to the gym, there's only some lifts you'll do when nobody's around. Um, <laughs> Back squat is one of those for me. And then there's like the only lift you'll do when everybody is around. Um, for me, that's, that's like dips. I can, I can, I'm pretty savage at dips and chin ups. I can put a lot of weight on those, but barbell back squats, you'll never see me doing it. Oh, that's, that's funny. I like your, your, um, openness about that. I think for me, it'd be bench press. I suck at bench. I'm not- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just don't, you won't see me doing those. Yeah. Uh, I have a very strange disparity in bench press. I have a, I'm pretty strong with the dumbbell bench press, you know, all things considered. I can put, I can put up the hundreds on the inclines fairly, fairly respectably, not too much struggle, but the barbell bench press, same thing. I'm, yeah. 
I'm, I'm not impressing anybody with my barbell bench press. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad we had that in common. Mm -hmm. I, I used to love dips and pull-ups. I used to do weighted dips and pull-ups all the time. I overdid it, and I, I paid the price. I ripped out my funny bone nerve right here. Yeah. I think I was trying to impress a girl or something, but um, that was like 20-some mm -hmm. years ago. I do miss dips. They're a lot of fun, though. Yeah. For, for me, they've always felt good. Um, I... I incorporate them as, as much as I can. Uh, I, I haven't done them in a while since I don't have a, a dip station here at home. I should get one of those standing towers though. Oh, yeah. Um, and yeah, it's just one of those things. We all have our sort of natural inclinations of the thing. Like I've always just been good at them. Um, same thing with chin ups, same thing with pistol squats. I've always, as just as I've always been not good at, at back squats and, and bench press just is what it is, you know? Yeah. And <laughs> Uh, I like that. It's mm -hmm. good to be humble and honest about that stuff. Mm. Yep. Well, that's really helpful. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. My training is pretty basic, but uh, I think I'm going to incorporate a little more hypertrophy as well. Got time to rest. Got plenty of time to cook food. Might as well. Right. Just yeah, it's, it's nice. Yeah, so what, what, just out of curiosity, what are you doing right now? Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I my basic has always been, well, for like the last three years, has been what they call the quick and the dead from Pavel, the O3, mm -hmm. so which is basically – um, 15 seconds about ballistic full body, something or other, usually hinge and then yeah. waiting a certain amount of time. And then a ballistic of an upper body, like a mm -hmm. dip would be a good example, or a Viking push press or a push up or a plyo push up if you can. Mm. So it's basically that I do that fasted, uh, three or four days a week. And then, um, I add in the grinds, you know, I love the cleans, uh, the presses, the double squat or the offset squat. And then, for conditioning, it's moving. I spent the last four days moving my in-laws. Mm -hmm. Like, just, they have four girls under the age of six. So I'm, like, moving just so many toys and stuff and building desks for them. And I um, we have Apple Watches. I bought my wife one for our anniversary. Oh, nice. I, yeah, they're, they're actually, I never wanted one. Everybody's like, you should get one. I was like, I don't want any technology. I just need a regular watch. Then I watched how well it worked for her for accountability with her mother and her friends. So now... We challenge ourselves every week, and I was like, "What the heck? I'm gonna put it on activity as I'm moving five hours, 2,500 calories." And she's like, "You're cheating!" I'm like, "No, it's, it's I'm sweating. It's 98 degrees. I'm moving stuff. That's activity." <laughs> that's yeah, <how> I <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. Um, I've, I've like anything else, I've been like, "Should I get one of those things?" And cool. you know, I'll talk I talk myself into it, and then my wife will talk me out of it because she's the voice of reason. Of <laughs> they always are. Yep. Yeah, they always are. So I, I don't have one yet, but yeah, that's. You know, I'm a suck. I'm a sucker for just. I, I am. I'm just a sucker for for stuff like that. Yes. Um, tracking apps. I'm. I'm. A, I totally give in to all of it. I do. Oh, then you mm -hmm. would dig it. You know, I was talking to Dr. Craig Mark about this last week. Mm -hmm. I'm a nerd for this stuff too. I've got like heart rate monitors. I'll track resting heart rate, heart rate variability, which is a very, very cool thing to track. And on here, there's heart rate variability on here. So it'll do it randomly. And if it shows up anything lower than like 25, I'm like, Oh God, I'm being too reactive. I'm not breathing through my diaphragm. I'll take two minutes and do some box breaths. Oh, that's super cool. Yeah. So that right there has kept my stress level a lot lower because it's easy to get in your head and, and think something. But then when you have data, you're like, Oh, okay. It is, it is measured. I can change this. Yeah. And even just the reminders because yeah. you're just, your awareness might, might just not be on it. Oh, of course. Mm -hmm. I, I, like you, I can get on a project and just lose my mind for six hours straight. But this mm -hmm. reminds me to stand up, do some five-second box breaths, you know? And then, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's kept me healthier than I thought. Okay, you might, you might get me in trouble with the wife <laughs> again here, Sean. Like, but on, on, say it's an anniversary present for each other. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if she gets one too, she will appreciate it. There's a lot of cool things about it. Yeah, our, mm -hmm. our nieces know how to operate. I get to my visit them. They're like, did you know you can do this? I'm like, I didn't know it can do anything besides time and heart rate variability, to be honest. You know, that always amazes me of just how intuitive these devices are. And you can, you can see that because of how easily children figure them out. I mean, the stuff my kids can do on our, on our iPhones, for example, or even like the Nintendo Switch. I'm like, wait, <laughs> That's a how, did you, how did you do that? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Oh. They're all under six years old, by the way. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can relate. I have six under six, uh, female wise. Every time I see them, I learn something new. It's awesome. Yeah, forget instruction manuals. I'll just hand my, whatever new gizmo I get to my kid. <laughs> right. Or, IKEA, we had uh, these desks to put together, and they're just like, this goes over here. I'm like, verify. I'm like, yeah, actually, it does. Okay, cool. Very mm -hmm. perspective. Yeah.
Uh-huh. That's yeah. That's that's good. That's cool. And I ne- I haven't done the Quick in the Dead program. I mean, yeah, obviously, I, I I think very highly of all of Pavel's stuff. Um, I actually haven't done a Pavel program in a in a minute. Maybe maybe after I'm done this little phase, I'll have to cycle. Oh, please cycle back around. Yeah, mm-hmm. they sent over another one too. It's basically a clean, a press, and a squat and a renegade row. Mm-hmm. Real simple. And- yeah, yeah. I I still think that one of his his absolute best um, was the I don't even know if you can get it anymore, but it was one of the first ones I got. One of my old boxing coaches gave it to me. Was just the original Russian kettlebell challenge. Do you have a copy of that one? Ooh, I have watches. Not enter the kettlebell. It's it's got to be the original Russian kettlebell challenge. Sorry, listeners, I don't have all of his books, but I have most of the manuals right here. Um, mm-hmm. And in there is Naked Warrior, and no, I don't have that one. Yeah, see, I don't have it anymore either. I lent it to someone at, at some point, but it was such a great program, and it was before en- it was before Enter the Kettlebell. This was like early on. Wow, what, was um, it what, what two moves was it based on? Do you remember? No, it was a bunch of moves. Like okay. so, yeah, yeah. So it wasn't it wasn't like simple and sinister. There was all sorts of stuff in there. Oh wow. Yeah, uh, he had. I'm pretty sure he had push press and jerk in there, and then, and then, you know, I guess as RKC developed, he decided he wanted to take uh, more of a minimalist approach, which I certainly appreciate. But um, there was a lot of genius in that in that program. Unfortunately, I, I don't remember a lot of the details right now, but I remember I benefited a lot from that early on. Let's track that down. Yeah, the Russian kettlebell challenge. Uh, like I said, I'm not sure if it's available anymore, but if it is, definitely worth scooping up. I'll uh, I'll hit up Amanda from Strong First and see if we can't track that down for us. Mm-hmm. That'd be good. Yeah. What was your first foray into kettlebells? What got you curious into them? Right. So uh, martial arts was my first foray into fitness. Right. So my background growing up was the kid who exercised for me was eating and resting. Sean, that was that was that was the routine growing up. Eating, resting, and video games was my exercise for a large portion of my life. Uh, got nice and portly, uh, you know, was kind of the chubby one among the friends, eventually decided this, this has got to stop. Um, but I didn't want to go to the weight room, uh, because you know, like that's where like my friends who were also the jocks were working out and it's like, man, I, if I go in there, they're just going to rib me the whole time. And they totally would have too. Right. So like, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. Um, so I wussed out there and instead I went to a martial arts studio, uh, Taekwondo kind of on a whim actually with a friend of mine. Uh, we were just kind of like just drive, you know, driving by one day, I guess, home from school. And we went in and took like a free lesson. And I actually like loved it. And um, I had a great coach. He was a great mentor. He got me into like really properly understanding fitness and nutrition. And this was this. Is, yeah, this would have been early high school. And uh, no kettlebells at that point. But it got I got really interested in Taekwondo, uh, started getting competitive with it. Um, then when I go to college, I'm on the, I'm on the competing team and that's where I meet Sam and Sam is my, uh, is my Taekwondo coach at that point. So he takes me down to his gym and this is, um, when, when this would, this would have been, this would have been, uh, 2008 ish. And, um, that's where, um, I, I'm first introduced to kettlebells, both by him and, and Brian Petty. And, um, you know, as it usually goes, uh, they just totally, you know, roped me into doing the cert like three months later. So I just like kicked it into super high gear. And when I passed the RKC cert, I was the youngest person to ever do it at the time. Um, wow. So that was kind of cool. Um, but yeah, that was my, that was how I got into it. So it was through martial arts and I was doing, you know, I was doing traditional weightlifting. I was doing, you know, dumbbells, barbells, all that stuff. And Sam's like, Hey, you gotta, you gotta start checking out these kettlebells. I think these are going to help you out a lot. Um, fell in love with them. And then I was like, yeah, this is, this is my thing. Mm-hmm. That's so cool. And um, that's a great path. And I've watched Sam demonstrate the kettlebell swing. And I remember like a video of yours years ago. You're talking, he's just quiet and just knocking out fluid, amazing two-handed swings. I was like, that guy. Well, good. He's, he's a total technician, right? So first off, he's like a millionth degree black belt in, in Taekwondo, and he's been a martial artist his, his entire life. So, I mean, you should, you should just see. He's also, he is also like extremely humble. It's hard to find like any videos of him doing stuff. So you really got to kind of come into the gym to see his chops, and they're really impressive. I remember we were first, we were first sparring, and I had, I'd been sparring for a while at this point, and the first time Sam kicked me, <laughs> I, I will always remember that. 
right? Uh, like I had never felt that much force in my life, right? Like this was like, I wanted to just turn over and cry. I was pretty sure all my ribs were broken. Um, I'm like, all right, this dude, this dude's on to something. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so no, he's a he's an absolute technician. He's he's very humble. He's extremely strong in not just kettlebells and barbells. So he's a if you're in the like southeastern Pennsylvania area and you're into kettlebells and martial arts, you got to get down to his gym's called the Dragon Gym and just and just train with the master himself. Uh, because yeah, most of most of what I learned was 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 just through him. What a great mm-hmm. mentor! It, it's for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and every time I see him in a video or on your podcast. It's, he's a he's a quiet operator. He's, he's, he's uh, his words are wise. He's like the Yoda. It's right. Yeah. He's good yeah. Yeah. It, we call it the Psalm says segment. He's he's <laughs> very concise. Mm-hmm. He's also he's got an interesting story too. Just just real quick. You know, he, I'm gonna hook you two up because he's he'd be a great podcast guest. Sean. Love to. Yeah. Um. You know he went to UPenn for electrical engineering. But like same, so kind of like similar with me, like not related to fitness. Yeah. And then he's just like, nah. I'm just I'm just gonna buy this gym and. This will be my thing. And that's what he's been doing ever since. Yeah. Wow. Good for him. I love those kinds of stories. Yeah. Let's, let's get him on the show and pick his brain. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely a worthwhile guest. Lots of knowledge to share in many different areas. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Oh, very excellent. Oh, that's great stuff. Yeah. I'm looking for that book too. I, I, yeah. Pavel's work is amazing. And Steve Cotter too. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know. I think I got into kettlebells. I got Steve Cotter's Encyclopedia of Kettlebell Exercises. I remember that one. Yeah, yeah. one and two. Yeah. So I'm like studying them and watching them, and then I don't have anybody around me to teach me correctly until Eric Frohart, and then I go into Strong First and follow a path that kind of how you learned as well. But uh, yeah, and again, it's a fantastic tool, and you don't have to do it dogmatically. There's a lot of ways to approach it, right? It's fun to try new things. Um, for example, I'm, I'm training out of a new gym. Uh, great people. They're, they're vets and they're very versed. Uh, FMS, TRX, Strong First, uh, MoveNet. We have MoveNet set up. Have you ever seen the MoveNet set up? It's like uh, the warrior stuff. It's crazy. Yeah, no, I don't know if I have actually. It, oh, they, it's monkey business, crazy stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but they started squatting with knees past toes. I'm like, what are you guys doing? Oh, yeah. And then they did it gracefully. And I'm like, all right, mine's blown. None yeah, like the old Hindu squats, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. Toes. So some will say that for him, those are just squats. Right. <laughs> Touche. Two levels. Mm-hmm. I like it. Yeah, no, it's true. Like, there's a lot of ways to, uh, to approach these things. Right. And yeah, no, I'm a, I'm a big fan of that, right? So, um, look, I mean, our knees are going past our toes all the time. You go up a flight of stairs, like, try not to put your knees past your toes. So, <laughs> yeah. you might as well strengthen the pattern and just right. do it reasonably, do it sensibly. And if you do that, you know, especially if you kind of, like, train on those extremes, and you do it, and you do it sensibly. I think you will just be that much more resilient to injury, right? Resilient, and that's so key for all of us, right? Um, for the people I work with, sometimes like for split boarders, snowboarders, and skiers, the knee is going past the toe all the time. So, I remember right back before all the gyms closed, I'm training one of my backcountry elite skiers, and I allowed his knees to go past in the squat. And other trainers are like, "What are you doing, Mike? If you were on the mountain and you were skiing with us, you would see this pattern." So we're, yeah. we're this pattern. And it's, it's totally a sensible thing to do, right? And it's like, okay, maybe that won't be like the, uh, like, you know, squats on like the balls of your feet, you know, like the extreme knee forward squat. Okay, maybe you're not going to sit, you know, records in the back squat from that position. Right. But higher reps there, you know, with body weight, I, I find them extremely therapeutic Absolutely. for the joints. Mm-hmm. Extremely therapeutic and definitely. So yeah, it's not a pattern that I, I aggressively load. I don't think you you need to do that but it's definitely something that i think is worth incorporating because again it kind of strengthens you at the extreme ends of what is normal healthy range of motion still that's right. that is normal healthy range of motion so we want to make sure we are strong at those ends so that way when we find ourselves in that position we're not going to snap we're not going to break mm-hmm. yeah oh that's great advice pat i'm glad to hear it from you too so it's not just me preaching this guys <laughs> no 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 i think this is this is somewhat it's becoming increasingly well recognized. I think people are finally breaking out of that old, very odd. It was very odd. It still lingers, right? Like there's this like, I don't know, like everybody's treated like an invalid, like never squat past, not even just your knees going forward, but like don't ever squat past parallel. It's like, what are you talking about? Right? 
Like, 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 first off, the, like, whatever they're basing this off of from the science is it's totally outdated and junk at this point. And it's like, I look at my kids and they have these such beautiful deep squats, right? It's like, this is how the human body is meant to move. And we follow a very, like, one, we follow a pretty basic use it or lose it principle. Mm -hmm. And I, I'll agree, like, if you haven't done deep squats in a long time, right, and you've been essentially sedentary for 30 years, yeah, we might want to, we might not you know, want to test the range of motion too quickly, you know, uh, with too much intensity, but we might not want to be doing back squats at all at that point, right? We might want to try and get that range of motion back first before we start loading it up with barbells or, or kettlebells or, or anything like that. Um, so to me, it just is, I, I guess I've, I've, I feel like the, the conversation has moved forward on this issue. Uh, yet some of those, some of those, I guess, I don't know, myths, still remain they're still they're still around mm -hmm. they are yeah it's nice to explore and it's not even new it's actually old it's just revisiting it right make like, okay this does work um yeah i actually my favorite pattern is to sit in a very deep squat because that way i'm yeah. at the level of my dogs or my nieces or when i'm training people it's that's a good place to get a good uh side view of what their patterns are and it's absolutely yeah it's it's good for you it's good for your hips it's good for your knees yes there are exception cases right of course mm -hmm. there's exception cases to anything but we don't we don't build the rule on the exceptions this is a normal healthy pattern we want to be able to access it and we want to be able to hang out there so i'm yeah. with you yeah just the, the body weight just the deep squat sits are, are awesome yeah good stuff really good stuff oh pat this has been a lot of fun we've covered a lot of great territory you get the your book religion philosophy uh Fitness myths busted. We got busted. Busted them. Cracked them open. Um, music. I, I love it. Anything else you want to cover? Always no, man. It's I always enjoy these conversations. Eclectic, but uh, but again, I, I get a lot out of them. Um, okay. By the way, if anybody needs help on the podcast setup, Sean's your guy. I want to give you. <laughs> I want to acknowledge you've been helping me. Uh, I haven't done it yet, so don't judge it. Don't judge it yet. But he's helping me get a prettier setup here. So maybe next time we have this conversation, Sean, I'll, I'll look as good as you. Well, that's very flattering. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, and he is right. I'm honored to help anybody with their podcast uh, or YouTube video setup. I, I love doing this stuff. It doesn't have to be with fitness. It can be for whatever your business is. Anything you're out there serving your customers and clients, we can make it look better. It's easy. Uh, it's fun. And it's, yeah, thanks for the shout out, Pat. I, I appreciate that. For sure. Um, so I'm going to have links to Pat's books. He has some uh, for dummies books too. I mean, he's very well published. One of my favorites is how to be better at almost everything. It's fantastic. His new one is how to think about God. It's one dollar. I'll buy it for you if you need it. <laughs> if anybody wants it for free, just email me. You just you you make it a dollar just so it like ranks on on Amazon. You know. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'll I'll try it. My next uh, cheesy ebook I create. Mm -hmm. One dollar. One dollar. Uh, good stuff. Well. Um, Pat, thank you for your time. All the best to you and your family. And happy anniversary. Hope you had a good anniversary as well. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Sean. Really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And to you listeners out there and viewers, um, hope you found some value in this. There's a lot of good takeaways. I'll try and put as much as possible in the show notes so you can make your life even better. And until next time, take care. <laughs>